everybody. Happy Friday. We're really happy, happy to have you with us as always. Um, and you are on Find My Past Fridays. We're really excited. All right. So um, we are, we have a lot to talk about this week, actually. So um, I'm pretty happy to be with you this Friday. Um, I don't get to do these as often as I might like, although don't tell Ellie I said that because she'll schedule me more often. Just kidding. Um, kind of. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's Friday. And uh, for me, it's Friday morning. For, for those in the UK, it's Friday afternoon. Hopefully you've had a good day so far. We're starting to see some of our friends say hello. So please do acknowledge in the chat. Let us know how you're doing, where you're from, uh, what you're up to, what you're researching. We're excited to hear your stories. Uh, my name is Jen Baldwin. I am the Data Acquisition Manager for North America for Find My Past. And I am also a genealogist. I've been researching since I was about 10, give or take. Um, when grandma sat me down and, and started telling me her stories and I will be forever grateful to her for that. Um, so I always really enjoy these discussions because it's like being with my people, right? You guys are my tribe and I love it. Um, and I really miss conferences. I'm just going to be honest. COVID is taking too long. Uh, all right. So it's Friday. We release new records every Friday. We're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about Black History Month a little bit. Um, it is Black History Month in the UK, which we are really, really honored to be a part of and to be celebrating all month long. Um, and we are going to talk about fan research today. Um, we have Ellie in the comments. So everybody say hi to Ellie. Thank you so much for being here, Ellie, and helping me out. It's always so appreciated. Uh, I did it for her yesterday. So she she's doing it. See, we, it works really well. <laughs> um, all right. We've got William is with us as always. Thank you so much, William, for being here. It's rainy in Cumbria, he says. Rachel's here. Um, Sunny here in Fife for now. Uh, <laughs> um, hopefully that lasts a little bit longer for you. Um, Sue, let's see, she's from uh, Surrey and it's cloudy. That's too bad. Uh, Kelly, Victoria says hello, everybody. Um, a sound check from Allie. Thank you very much, Allie. Um, Rosie's with us as per usual. Um, let's see, who else is here? Barbara's from Illinois. Thank you very much for being with us, Barbara. That's always great to see you. Hello, Ellen. Always good to see you as well. Rainy Essex. Oh, Georgia. It's. It's just that time of year, isn't it, right? For those of us in in this hemisphere, right? For anybody in Australia, you're in New Zealand, you're getting into your spring and the rest of us are getting into fall. And it's, it's. I have to admit, it's gorgeous outside of my house. Like all the leaves are turning colors and everything, but the the forest fires in, what, in the Western Washington, or Western United States, California, and throughout Colorado, even where I'm at, are, are pretty bad. In fact, the smoke level today is, is quite bad. Um, I was just checking the air quality and it's really poor. So it's like one of those days where I'm not going to let my daughter play outside kind of thing. It's pretty ugly. Um, Linda's from Washington. Uh, let me know where, it, Linda, because I grew up in Washington and I'm always, always looking to connect with people. Um, and my family's from Washington. So let us know where you're at, Linda, specifically, and hope that you're okay doing all right with the fires. Roz is in Massachusetts, um, all sorts of, oh, Victoria says, loved your open box session. Um, thanks for sharing with us. And that's good that you brought that up, Victoria, because I'm going to use some examples from that box later this, later in the session. We've got Ian from North Wales and Janet from North Wales. Maybe you guys could um, have a cup of coffee together uh, <laughs> and talk about your research. Um, Dave's with us from Beverly, Catherine from Massachusetts. Gabrielle asks, are you related to me? We share a surname. Um, actually, Gabrielle is my, ma my married name, so it would be my husband that you would be related to, but um, uh, I don't know much about his tree, actually, So, and that's kind of a long story. John from Canada. Patricia says hi to Jen and Ellie. Hillary, Hillary excuse me, um, is with us. Gosh, so many people. Thank you all so much for checking in. Love, love, love all these comments. I could literally just read this all day. Um, Oh, Bev's from Edmonton. I have ancestors who lived outside of Edmonton, actually. Um, so that's kind of fun um, for just one generation. But, uh, oh gosh, Linda, she grew up on Whidbey Island. Rainy, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, Audrey says she missed conferences too. Yeah, totally. I so miss seeing everybody. Um, but I'm glad it's not raining for you anymore. Um, okay, all right. Question of the week is, question of the week, 
um, what is one story or discovery that you've made about someone that is not part of your direct lineage? We're going to talk about fan research later in the hour. And that's why we're asking that question, right? Because fan research is friends, associates, and neighbors. We're going to get into that, but share your discoveries. Um, Lori, where else do we get a worldwide weather report? It's so true. I yeah, that's true. I really like that. Um, uh, yeah, so um, talk about fan research. Share your stories with us. What is the, the discovery that you've made that you, you really enjoy the most or you love the most, you found the most interesting about someone who is not part of your direct lineage? So, And how does that relate, right? We're going to talk about all of that. Um, but let's get into the best stuff of the week, right? Which is almost always new records. Everybody loves new records. Um, it is Black History Month, so we did release over 780,000 new records from Jamaica with improved search features. And I think that's probably the biggest component of that part of this week's release is the new search features are actually really important because it really helps um, get into those records in a, in a more specific and precise way. So done a lot of work there. Um, Stephen Rigdon especially um, deserves kind of a shout out for that one. He did a ton of work on those records. So um, 780,000 vital events, birth, baptism, marriage, and death from Jamaica. Um, we also added to our nonconformist uh, births and baptisms with records from Surrey from the Methodist uh, faith, thousands of new records for Methodists. So if you um, have nonconformists in your tree, always a good idea to check that record set. Um, it's a big one and it's an important one. I actually have several ancestors who are part of that collection, which is always really cool. Um, and it is, like I mentioned, Black History Month in the UK. So um, make sure to read the blog every day because we're posting a new blog every single day this month to celebrate Black History. Um, and there's been some really incredible stories shared. So um, I'm going to add a second question of the week. It's a challenge week. Two questions. What has been your favorite story that we've shared so far from Black History Month? So if you have one that you've really enjoyed, let us know in the comments um, or share the link even if you want to so other people can enjoy it as well. Um, and a quick tip for those in the U.S. and Canada, um, the daily post for Black History Month is not being shared on the .com blog. Now, it's Black History Month in the U.K., Black History Month in the United States is in February, and I think that's true for Canada as well, if I remember right. So um, most of these blogs are going to the .co.uk site. So go to the Find My Class blog on .co.uk so you can get these daily stories um, uh, in, because they're not all being published on, on .com. Um, so we've got a couple people sharing in their, their question of the week, so that's great. Add your comments. We'll get to those. Um, when we start talking about fan research. So that that's exciting. Um, thank you for sharing those. But I do want to also mention before we get to that, um, we published a video, I think yesterday, the day before, I think yesterday. Um, and it is um, the story of um, Sylvia and her journey from um, where she grew up into the UK in the 1960s as a black woman. And it's actually the mother of one of our, our colleagues, employees at Find My Past. Um, and so our so Carrie interviews her mom about her memories and her stories. Um, and it is one of the most moving and touching videos I think I've seen in a long time. It's just a really important component of history to, to learn about and, and know about. Um, in, in, at one point in the video, Sylvia says, they don't let you just be a normal human being. You're always being tested. And I, I mean, that just like, wow, what a, what a powerful statement, right? It's, um, it's a serious issue. Obviously, it's something that we need to address, uh, this racial inequalities. But, um, but it's such a personal look into her life and, and her experiences and, and her story. And it's just, it, you have to watch it. You just, you, I don't know that I can even put into words. Um, I actually watched it yesterday and then I watched it again this morning and, um, and I'm still a little bit like, whew, that it's, it's intense. It's a lot. Um, and it's, it's very emotional, very powerful. Um, so please do watch it and, um, raise your awareness if nothing else, um, and enjoy that family story for what it is, but also, you know, take into account the experiences of our, fellow human beings. It's, it's really incredible. Um, and really just, you know, them sharing that personal story is, it means a lot to us uh, um, as a, a family, the Find My Pets family feels like that's really special. So make sure you watch that. It's in the blog. 
It's on the Facebook page and it's on our YouTube channel. Um, so another, oh, Victoria, Sylvia's video brought tears to my eyes. Just wanted to give her a massive hug. Yeah, exactly. Sylvia, that's, or Victoria, that's exactly how I felt. Um, it just, it's really special. Oh, and Ellie, thank you. Ellie shared it in the chat. So everybody has a direct link. It's just powerful. It's all, all I can really say. Um, all right. From, see, look, I'm like, I'm like all emotional already. Okay. Um, newspapers this week, we did a bunch of additions to newspapers. So look at the blog for the full list. Um, but a couple highlights uh, include the Peterborough Standard from 1872 to 1962. So that's a pretty significant run um, in terms of year coverage. We've got uh, Inver Gordon. Look at me challenging myself growing personally by trying to pronounce things I don't know how to pronounce. Inver Gordon Times and General Advertiser from a variety of years, but 1879 to 1886 and then 1888 and 1892. Um, so that's a good one. Those are some, some key years, right, for newspaper coverage. Ben Brierley's journal, uh, also covering a variety of years, 1874 to 1881, 1883 and 84, 86, and 1888 to 1889. So some really, really good titles this week. Um, do make sure to check out the blog and see everything um, that we've published because there was quite a list of newspapers this week. All right, um, we're going to talk... We're going to spend most of our time talking about fan research. Um, so I want to get into some of the stories that you guys have been sharing. And thank you for doing that. Um, <laughs> William, that is really funny. Can we rename these Friday sessions as Friday weather reports with a bit of genealogy? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good idea. So actually, this is, um, you know, my so my dad lives alone now, um, and he is a ham radio operator. He has been for a really long time, it, mo like well, really all of his adult life. Um, and in fact, that's how he and my mom met is over ham radio. Um, and so I was telling him recently about some conversations I've been having with Australian genealogists, and he kind of laughed and he said, you know, every evening when he logs on to his favorite ham network uh, and talks to people. That's one of the first things they do is share the weather report. And there's always someone from Australia checking in and sharing the weather report in Australia on the ham network as well. So I feel like my dad and I have this thing going about, you know, international weather reports now. It's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> oh, and Richard says, uh, enjoyed yesterday's talk um, on Facebook Live. So if you did not watch um, yesterday's interview between Ellie and Porin talking about Caribbean um, and research, um, and West Indies, please do so. It was a great, great interview. Really good discussion. Lots to learn. Okay, um, so a few comments from the question of the week. Um, Amy says, a sixth cousin, first times removed of hers, is married to a man called Lawrence Harvey Zeiger. You might know him as Larry King. Oh, Larry King. What a cool story. Very good. Um, so that's interesting fan research for, sh for sure. Um, Kelly, her question of the week answer, a few years ago I discovered my great-great-granddad's brother, William, shot himself dead at his work office. Oh my goodness. Even more tragic, 10 years later, William's son shot and killed a lady who spurned his advances, then turned the gun on himself. So, Kelly, you and I have a murder-suicide in common. Um, I have a collateral ancestor as well who, um, a slightly different, but he ran off with his girlfriend, his mistress, actually, um, and they did like this, basically a road tour across the western United States. They were living outside of Chicago, and they end up in a hotel in Denver. Um, and he tells the mistress, he's, and this is all covered in the newspapers really thoroughly. He tells the mistress he's going to go back to his wife. And he's leaving her in Denver um, in this hotel. And she pulls the gun out and shoots him and then kills herself. And it was this huge story in Denver newspapers. I probably have, I don't know, 10 or 12 newspaper articles just on um, the details, like there's a sketch of how they laid, like the, where the bodies were in the hotel room and everything. It's just it's like CSI on TV. It's crazy. Um, so we have that in common, which is kind of weird. Um, but so does Patricia. I found a murder in my sister-in-law's research. So there's a lot of murders going on today. Maybe we should have talked about crimes um, <laughs> instead. 
Maybe that'll be my next one. Um, Kathy says her discovery was that my mom's next door neighbor for 40 years is very distantly related through marriage. Oh, that's really neat, actually. Um, I love it when that happens. Gary, a family baptizing their children over 600 times over 10 years in England and Wales. What? And he's, he's written a blog post about it. Or maybe that is, maybe it is the blog, The Serial Baptist. He shared a link. So everybody go out and check out Gary's blog post on The Serial Baptist. That sounds fascinating. I will definitely be reading that, Gary. Um, thank you so much for sharing it. Um, Lisa Taylor Vences in Bellevue, Illinois, and she is related to President Zachary Taylor through a different Taylor line. Um, and he's been in the news recently because one of his um, grandsons, I, if I remember right, just died. And considering when Zachary Taylor was alive uh, and the grandson dying in 2020, that's kind of, you know, big generations. Um, my husband and I are not related, but we have a distant cousin in common. My parents also had the same thing happen. Oh, that's interesting. So you've got Taylor lines on both sides of the family, but not actually related that you know of yet. <laughs> I say it with a wink. Um, all right, let's see. Um, I'm scrolling. Sue says, let's see, and this one's getting good reactions. Let me see what Sue has to say. I spent two years researching a friend's grandfather who it turned out had left his first wife, no children, his second wife, slipped into the first wife's persona, even giving first wife's name as mother of children. No idea what happened to the first wife. She worked for an, an American woman. Maybe she left with her. Oh, wow. That's bizarre. Um, I think that's the word I'm going to use. That's bizarre. Okay. Um, what a great story, though, Sue. Thanks for sharing it. Audrey, I researched a friend's family history. He worked for the Labor Party and for a trade union. He took it remarkably well when I told him he was descended from the Roper family. <laughs> okay, that made me chuckle. It's really funny, Audrey. <laughs> Sylvia is saying hello before getting back to her thesis. Sylvia, let us know how it goes. We really are anxiously awaiting results on that thesis. Um, Want to know more about it. Um, so let us know. Uh, Janet, my late gra grandmother's neighbor was a tram motorman and was in Royal Marines in the First World War. His sister married Emile de Suter, who was a well-known aviator who crashed, lost a leg, and his family firm started producing a lighter weight artificial limbs. Oh, wow. Well, that's cool. Um, I wonder if there are patents and that kind of thing on those products. I bet there are. Um, that would be interesting to find. Um, <laughs> Claire declined the weather update because Australia is too large. That's funny. Um, ah, Robert, my late father-in-law was a radio ham call and he gives a call sign. My son was able to take that call sign 14 years ago after his grandfather's death. Oh, that is so special, actually. I, so I, I clearly remember and have memorized my, both of my parents' ham radio call signs, um, we should have we should have a discussion about ham radio calls and ham radio apparently because that was a it's been a very big thing for a long time um and in fact both my parents had theirs as their license plates um for many many years uh and they used it for you know passwords and stuff and i was like you gotta stop doing that um, uh yeah I'm so, i love that story robert thank you so much um Andrew, currently researching my fourth twice removed, a guy called Andrew Benbow, who was given the job of superintendent of the Royal Muse in 1913 until 1929. Interesting stories. These are great. I love all these stories. Um, yeah, and Linda says the same thing. Gotta love these family stories, and I do love them. It's so fantastic. So one from Ellie, too. There was an old family story I was told that on oh, my dad's son and related to William Wadsworth, um, but no connection yet. Um, Ellie, we're going to work on that. I promise. Okay, so what are we talking about friends and uh, or fan research rather? And so what is fan research? Some of you sound like you're pretty well experienced in this, which is great. But for those of us who maybe are not familiar with the acronym, um, fan research is friends, associates, and neighbors. Now, there are a couple variations on this. And in some cases, it's referred to as cluster genealogy, but it kind of just depends on the education you've received and you know what what webinar you watched or whatever but the term was kind of coined by elizabeth Schoen mills several years ago she's of course a um highly reputable well-known genealogist um, based here in the united states um and when she talks about fan research and she has several blog posts and all sorts of 
information out there um, that you can look up. Uh, it, her, her description of fan research, I had to kind of rethink my train of thought there. Um, really, she, she goes into a lot of de great detail and uses a lot of really good examples. But there are a couple of one-liners from her that I actually really like. And I pulled one of them um, that kind of explains why this is so important. So I'm going to read this to you. So this is a quote from a blog post. Um, and I'm going to ask Ellie to post the link in the chat for everybody. So the quote is this. All these trials explain why many successful researchers live by the fan principle. When those we study left no document to handily supply the information we seek, we often find it in the records created by members of their fan club, their friends, associates, and neighbors. And I think that this is one of the biggest um, and best strategies for researching family history because family history is so much more than just who begot who, right? As we all know, it's about these stories that we've all been sharing this today with each other and that we share um, all the time with each other with and with our family members and our friends, right? Family history is so much more than just the dash, right? It, the years at the start and the end of the dash, it's what happens during the dash. So I wanted to um, share a couple of my own personal experiences as a researcher, but I'm really happy to see that all of you guys are still sharing your stories. So please do, because um, I, I love hearing all of these, these little research discoveries that we've all made. Um, so last week I did a session on, on Find My Past Facebook, um, and I had received a box um, from my aunt, a, a box of family history materials that I had not really seen before. Um, and inside the box, um, were postcards. Now I knew the postcards were coming, but everything else I was kind of, I wasn't really sure what was in the box. Um, the postcards I have now counted, there are just shy of 300 postcards in the box. Now, some of them, about a hundred of them, roughly a third are actually just blank. Um, they're not, they're not written on, they were never mailed. They were never used. Um, just generic postcards. Not totally sure what I'm going to do with those just yet. But the other 200 do have writing on them in some capacity. Now, I haven't had a lot of time to really dig into this, but I do have the pile here. So hang on. Let me scoop these up. 200-ish postcards. Look at that. Um, all with writing on them. Now, some of them are from family that I, I recognize. Uh, this one right off the top, actually. And I will show you that picture. It's cool. It's some um, bighorn sheep. It was actually sent to um, my, let me think, my second great uncle when he lived in California. And it's from his brother who actually lived in Colorado for a while. Um, he was actually shot as well. Actually, speaking about murder, he was murdered. Um, and it is dated, let's see, uh, it, the stamp is too hard to read. But um, that's a great one of just fam, like a direct relationship, right? Um, these are collateral ancestors. I know exactly who they are. I can tell from the abbreviations and from the, from the signature on the back, right? But there are many that are not quite so clear cut. And I have a couple of examples here to share. Um, oh, I didn't actually even really look at the fronts really very much. Um, so we'll start with this lady here. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure what the joke is, but it says that settles it. And then there's some handwriting. Isn't she grand? Anyway, it's to my great aunt uh, when she lived in Nebraska. So before she was married, probably when she was teaching. And it's signed Dora. There's a personal message. Um, the date stamp is difficult to read, but I don't have any idea who Dora is. This one um, is to Carrie and her husband. Um, 1912, it's nicely dated, and it's signed, your friend, F. Rademacher, and then it says Franklin on the side, but then it's addressed, Dear Miss Brown. So actually, it was before she was married. I stand corrected. Um, the picture is Europe somewhere. Switzerland, maybe? Anyway, he's, he is talking about a voyage um, where he actually, I landed at Liverpool, um, and came by a London, Dover, Brussels, etc. I have no idea who this person is. Now, I have Rademacher's in my family, uh, in my research, 
but I don't know who Franklin Rademacher is. So that is going to be an interesting one to discover. And these are all Carrie, my great aunt Carrie's fan club, right? See where I'm going with this? Friends, associates, and neighbors. My third example is uh, the Santa Cruz Mission in Santa Cruz, California. Cool postcard. Um, it is addressed to Mrs. Adam Carlisle, so definitely after she was married. Um, and it is addressed, Dear Friends. So she, this person's actually sending it to probably both Carrie and her husband, Adam, right? Um, and it's signed Grace. And again, another very personal message on the postcard. Now, I have, you know, 200 or so of these to go through. Um, but this is the fan club research, right? All three of these postcards represent a part of Carrie's life that I don't yet know anything about. But this is opportunity for research. If I really wanted to know more about Carrie um, and her life with her husband, these postcards are going to help me learn that by figuring out who these people are, how they're connected, how did, how do they know each other, right? Did they work together? Are they neighbors? Um, I, I, there's so much opportunity in these 300 postcards. Am I ever going to get this research done? I don't know. 300 postcards is a lot. I'm hoping I'll find some consistency and some repetition. Um, so that's one example of how you could apply the fan club concept to your research, right? I have all of these pieces of family ephemera um, that I am going to have to try and somehow figure out, right? Now, a couple other examples that are maybe a little bit easier to connect. Um, and one thing that I really like to talk about, especially in the associates category, is fraternal organizations or friendly societies, uh, depending on where you're at in the world. Um, and I have a handful of materials from my grandmother when she was involved in the Rebecca's. And the one I pulled just to share is this card. Um, and it's just a kind of a thinking of you card. And it's addressed, Dear Sister Emma. Oh, so this is actually my great-grandmother, who was also a member of the same lodge, Rainbow Rebecca Lodge Number 31 in Ording, Washington. And it's signed by all these different people and all their different signatures. This is my great-grandmother's fan club right here, right? These are the women that she was affiliated with. They were members of the same lodge. Um, it implies that their husbands were also a member of the same lodge. Um, they probably had, you know, who knows what they did. They did charity work together. They might have done reading clubs. Like, you know, the sky's the limit on that. Um, but this is a part of her life that I don't know much about, right? Who did they spend time with? Who did she get a cup of coffee with? Um, this type of material is going to help me figure that out. And this is something I am actively researching, actually, is that that particular lodge. Now, a few years ago, I'm going to tell you a little story. A few years ago, I worked uh, for a historical society. I worked for the Breckenridge Heritage Alliance in Breckenridge, Colorado, and I was one of the tour guides. And I did the tour through the local cemetery, which I loved doing. And one of my favorite spots in the cemetery, you can stand in this one particular location. And I kind of had marked it on the ground for myself so that I could do it on my tour, right? If you stood in that specific place, you could stand there and you could say, okay, well, that guy right there who's buried there was the mayor of Breckenridge. And his wife is buried, you know, next to him. But her brother is right over here. And then the brother was a member of the same Masonic Lodge as the mayor but also he was the city clerk, you know, um, and then his wife or his brother-in-law or, you know, his, his friend is there and they were connected this way. And then that guy was shot by this person over here. And you could stand there and tell this entire story of the community just by pointing out the different headstones because all of them were connected somehow. And that is probably the best visual representation of the fan club I've ever seen because it was just, you know, that guy's, it, I mean, it literally just connecting all the dots of the whole community, you know, small town. So it was relatively easy to do. Um, and they all died within 10 years of each other. So their lives were uh, inter interlaced, right? Just like our lives are today, right? Part of my fan club um, eventually is, is the Find My Past community, right? How, what do we share? What records are we leaving behind of each other? And we're actually leaving a lot with all these Facebook comments. All right, I'm going to stop talking for a second. I'm going to go through some of those comments. Um, so Meredith says, I had trouble figuring out a, a, out a cousin of my husband. The cousin was married and had four children. Her husband died when she remarried. The second husband changed his name to first husband's name because they didn't want the children to have a different 
name to the husband in case they were teased at school, but I say very understanding second husband was very confusing research, but absolutely, that's a great example, um, Meredith, in that you have to know all of those little bits and pieces to kind of put the puzzle back together, right? Um, okay, let's see, uh, William's comment, uh, it's really sad where people think of a worst case scenario and then a lesser scenario is proven as the info gets changed so much as it's passed down. My great uncle's wife family believed her dad died in a Japanese POW camp. He actually died in the Shanghai General Hospital next to his apartment block. Oh, wow. Um, Ellie, that's a lot of postcards. I'm kind of jealous. Don't don't be jealous, Ellie. I don't know what I'm going to do with these 300 postcards. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. Um, yeah, so a couple more really great comments. Victoria says, my parents owned a pet shop in Chingford. I don't know where that is. And one of their neighbors across the road was Lord Norman Tebbit as his constituency was there. Oh, that's really interesting. So what kind of information um, do you have about that? Christine's comment is on the postcards, actually. Those blank postcards give you a travel history. Many picked them up, went away when cameras weren't as popular, didn't trust the picture taking. Yeah, Christine, I think that's really true. Um, I don't think that Carrie actually traveled very much herself. Um, and I have a lot of, she was a prolific letter writer. So I have a lot of documentation that kind of puts her in a time and place, even, you know, month after month after month over many years of her life. Um, so I'm not sure that she was the one who was traveling and purchasing these. I kind of get the feeling from some of the postcards that she might've been in some kind of like a letter writing club or something. Um, um, and, and um, people were sending each other blank postcards maybe, or I know there's like sets, right? That are fully intact still that she seems to have picked up enough. I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay, so let me, I'm, I'm still scrolling through comments. Uh, <laughs> Kelly says she was lucky. My mom gave, gave her all of her postcards and grandparents' postcards. There's a handful written and sent by family plus 100 plus from just places they'd been. Yeah, um, it's just crazy. Um, how many postcards are out in the world? A colleague of mine, a friend of mine collects postcards and he just like, he buys them off eBay from the town where he grew up because that's where most of his family is from is kind of that region. So he has a great collection, but he has to actually go out and find them. Um, okay, let's see. I'm still looking for comments. In the meantime, um, gosh, there's so many great comments and stories. This is so good. Um, Karen asks, can you explain what a lodge is in the US? We have Masonic Lodge in the UK, is it similar? Yes, it, basically the same thing. Um, most fraternal societies or friendly societies as they're known in the UK refer to the lodge uh, organizational system. So while many societies may call it something different, um, the hierarchy is almost always de des uh, designed and developed after the, the system of the Masons. Um, so, yeah, think of it in the, in the exact same terms as the Masonic Lodge. Um, Andrew asks, uh, and now I'm, I'm looking at my other screen for comments and Ali, I'm not ignoring you guys. Uh, need, needs advice about the wife of a first cousin of mine was the first treasurer of the Kansas Kennel Club, but I can't find out if it was the city or state. Any ideas where to look? Yes, lots of ideas. Uh, the Kansas Kennel Club. I don't know anything about that. Um, but I do know a lot about organizations, so you are definitely asking the right person, I hope. My first suggestion is to stop looking for the ancestor and start looking for the organization itself. Um, don't assume that records of these organizations are going to be on a site like Find My Past or Family Search or any of the other genealogy sites. They're probably not going to be. Um, there's very few fraternal records or club records of any nature on genealogy sites. So look at things like Google Books, Internet Archive, um, local historical societies, local museums. So if they were in um, Kansas Kennel Club, sounds like it's a state organization. I would start with Internet Archive and see if anything's been published. And then I would go to the Kansas Historical Society and ask them. Just send them an email. Um, most archives like that are very, very happy to respond to those types of queries. Um, so start with that and see where they point you. And it may be that the archive of that organization, if it is now defunct, um, is sitting at uh, probably a private archive or a university somewhere in the United States. Um, you could also look at uh, sites like JSTOR and newspaper publication sites. 
um, that give kind of contextual information. But again, don't, don't search for the ancestor, search for the organization itself. That's probably the biggest mistake that people make. And really in terms of the fan club as a whole, when you're looking for business partners or you know lawyers that they might've worked with or who was the doctor in town, right? Don't look for people, kind of have to shift your mindset a little bit, looking away from people and looking at the situation as a whole. So look for the club itself. Um, Jeanette asks, I've been trying to find out information on my paternal grandfather from Poland. Can you point me in the right direction? Well, I don't actually know a whole lot about Polish research, I'll be honest, um, but I would suggest looking at the Family Search Wiki um, to get started. It's uh, the Family Search Wiki, if you're not familiar with it, Jeanette, is a wonderful resource. And there's a lot of information there on how to get started in various uh, geographical regions, but also topical, right? So let's say for the first time you discover you have a Quaker ancestor, you could go to the Family Search Wiki and learn how to research Quaker records and what is available to you. So I would start on the Family Search Wiki, just do a quick search for Poland, um, and you'll get um, a result right away about um, uh, on a, on an article on a wiki about Polish research, where to start and how to get going, and what makes Polish research different than any other kind of you know area. What makes it special or unique or challenging? Um, okay, let's see. <laughs> Jen hums like I do when scrolling through the comments. I do, Ellie. I do. Um, William says, my great grandfather was a member of the United Brethren Lodge in Malta as a Freemason. You know, I, I could talk all day long about fraternal societies. Maybe I should probably do that soon, I guess. Maybe that's um, my next topic. Fraternal societies are absolutely fascinating. Um, it is literally, you know, for most of our ancestors, um, it was their social club, right? If you went to the lodge for the evening, um, it was to... to have possibly have a meeting and do some initiation rites or ritual, but it also could have very much just been hanging out with the guys, right? And like, you know, today, it, at least in the States, right, a lot of guys like to sit around and hang out and watch sports and they kind of talk amongst themselves and, and women do that too, right? We have our own social, you know, everybody has their own social aspects. I'm not trying to be too stereotypical, um, but that was, you know, that was their social venue for most people. I don't know as much about the UK. I'm learning. Um, but in the U.S., um, at the turn of the century, around the 1900s, one in seven, ev every adult in the United States was a member of at least one lodge of some kind, one kind of organization. So one in seven of every adult. So that's men and women by the turn of the century. So if you're not looking at fraternal society records, you're really missing out because you're getting angles on their, their life that you wouldn't get. So, for example, if you work through the Great Depression years and you see that they their membership started and stopped and started and stopped. It's probably because they couldn't afford to pay their dues, right? Their annual dues. If their membership was consistent through the depression, they had enough cash in their pocket to actually survive and continue to pay their membership dues. So that's an important reflection on their economical status during an incredibly economically difficult period in history, right? So un knowing that gives you a much better understanding of what their life was like during this historically incredibly important event, right? Um, newspapers are incredibly important in that research, but also contextual comment, um, uh, content, right? Like you might look in, on Internet Archive and you'll find a digitized version of the annual meeting, right? Almost all of these organizations had some kind of big lodge meeting where they would come together once a year and kind of make all the decisions for the year and elect new officers. That's where the juicy tidbits are. Um, there was a, there's an example I use often, actually. Um, it's from a, the State Lodge in Florida, Masonic Lodge in Florida. I think it was the Royal Archmasons, um, where they, have, they voted in this guy as treasurer. Um, and within the next couple of years, they actually realized that he was um, committing fraud, right? He was stealing from the lodge. Um, and so they record the, the implications in the first year's annual meetings, minutes, um, and they talk about the allegations against him. And they set aside a committee to research it. And they don't get another report on the events that's happening and, and the committee's work, actually determining if that's true or not. Um, until the next year's meeting, right? Because they only meet once a year, right? On the state level. So the second year, 
they report as to what they what they found, right? The third year, they make a decision as to what to do about it. So during this time, this guy is still the treasurer, right? Even though all of this is happening in the background and he's being investigated, he's still in his position. Um, and so the, finally in the fourth year, they actually tell him, we think you're guilty. And um, they, you know, force him out of the lodge. In the meantime, he's in the panhandle of Florida, right? So he's, it's a really thin area um, and it's really close to other states. So he joins another lodge in the next state to the north. And I, I want to say it was Mississippi, but I don't remember for sure. Um, and, and he actually, you know, gets himself in a good graces and he gains office in Mississippi. So when he gets kicked out of Florida, he's ready to step into the same role in Mississippi um, and, and likely does the same thing, right? And the thing is, it never leaves the lodge, right? No one ever talks about it. He's still an upstanding citizen in the community. Uh, it's never a crime that is, you know, tried in a court or anything because the lodge doesn't want to make it public, right? What happens in the lodge stays in the lodge to a certain extent. So you, you find this story of this embezzlement case in the records of the state lodge, but nowhere else. It's not in the newspapers. There's no criminal records. There's no court records. There's nothing. He just continues to live his life. And then he joins the Mississippi Lodge next. Um, and you, you can kind of imagine that his habits kind of continue on, right? Of course, because, you know, humans don't change that quickly. So if you don't look at records of the fan club, like lodges and, and um, organizations like this and clubs and societies, you're missing out on a huge, huge opportunity for research. Um, I hope someday I will meet actual family members of that man in Florida so I can tell them about this. Um, I've yet to meet anybody who's actually related though. Um, maybe they don't want to know. They don't want to know. I don't know. Um, so it's just, it's fascinating the types of things that we can get into. I have another example I want to share. This is a good one too. Um, and those of you who are in the Pacific Northwest, I hope will appreciate this. So I have this, I have a, actually a pretty significant collection of family stuff that's been passed down. Um, I come from a long line of, we won't say hoarders, but we will say, um, well, almost hoarders, right? <laughs> Close to hoarders, what's the next level down? Um, pack rats, maybe, a long line of pack rats. And in this collection is this photograph of my great grandpa um, and he was a member of the first or one of the first fire departments in a little tiny town called Ording, Washington. It's small. Um, it, this is the picture and the picture is well known. Um, the local museum has it. It's in books. Um, it is at the local historical society, like the genealogy society knows about this. Everybody knows about this photograph, right? And it is a, what I have is not the original. It's a postcard version. So I was, um, a couple years ago, a colleague in the genealogy world um, had decided to move. He, he was from Orning and he was moving back. So he and I were talking and his brother is the president of the Historical Society. And I love how that works. And so I'm emailing all the, you know, these two individuals about my family collection. And I'm, I'm actually working to donate some of my material to them because I have a lot. Um, and, and, they, and I said something about the photograph. And everybody knows it. it's the fireman photograph, right? And they said, I wish we knew who those men were. No one has a version of that photograph that has the names on it. And I said, what? Because my copy of the photograph has all the names on the back. As far as I know, it's the only copy that has the names. Um, my, <laughs> thank goodness, my, I think my great grandpa did this. I think he took the time to write down everybody's name. This is fan research that I can share far and wide. And I have actually, the Historical Society has a Facebook page and I have scanned this picture and transcribed all the names and shared this as, I mean, I'm going to keep this one, <laughs> but the Historical Society now has a very good scan, high quality, high res image of this so that everybody knows who these people were on the front of the picture. This is probably one of the best examples of fan research I can think of because these guys were all members of um, the same lodge. Almost all of them were involved in the same lodge and the Odd Fellows. Um, they obviously all served together right on this fire crew. Um, they presumably got along well most of the time, they all voted the same way. So they almost all leaned Republican. 
um, is from what I can tell in political records and newspaper reports and that kind of thing and like letters to the editor and that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's a pretty incredible piece, right? And we kind of forget how easy it is to take this kind of stuff for granted. Um, so someone somewhere has a postcard with names on the back that you want. And if we do enough fan research, we will find these postcards with each other. Um, so this kind of stuff gets really exciting, right? Because this is what makes genealogy's dreams come true. Um, I did see a couple comments. William, we're not hoarders. We're self-contained family archivists. I totally agree. That is my title. I'm thinking, though, about my ancestors who really did save everything. Um, my dad actually just has been cleaning up his house a bit. Um, and he just found a journal that he kept from a 1977 road trip when my family moved from Washington, D.C. to Washington State. Um, and he'd completely forgotten that he had it. And I'd never known about it before. And I was like, why in the world didn't you tell me about this? And he was like, well, um, I just forgot. So I can't call them archivists um, because there's no metadata. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, anyway, fan research. Let's, uh, that was, I'm, I'm off on all sorts of tangents, but I hope that some of these examples are proving the value of fan research. It can be really, really exciting. Um, you know, one of the other areas of the world that I, I like to work in in terms of history is the gold rush in the Western United States. And I was actually just helping a colleague with some of his research in that area. And he was saying, you know, why would this person come out and settle in this town. It doesn't look like he mined anything. He never put his hands down in the dirt. And I'm going, well, he probably sold stuff to the miners, right? Or he ran, it seems like he may have ran some kind of an operation in terms of like he had a business partner out in the hills actually trying to find gold. He was the front man actually here in Colorado. Um, and then there's probably some investor behind him back in the, in the Eastern seaboard somewhere saying, here's some cash go find me some gold, right? Create um, a strategy and, a, and an organization and a business around kind of investing in this mineral and the mineral rushes. So all of this ties into that fan research, right? We have to definitely get past just looking at our direct lineage and saying, what else is out there? Because there's so much opportunity for learning about every facet of our life, right? If you think about your life today and I think about, um, you know, I have to go to the grocery store, right? Um, someplace I have to buy clothes. I clearly buy a few books. Um, who do I deal with in those exchanges, right? And what did that look like for our ancestors? What did that look like 100 years ago? So I think about things like town politics and, you know, what happens when they needed a lawyer? Who did they go to? They probably went to someone they knew. And in that case, it's probably, especially in small towns, um, it would probably be someone really local, someone in their church, or possibly someone in their fraternal lodge. Um, so a couple of suggestions, especially for those in the UK. There was a wonderful address search on Find My Past uh, in our census records. You should absolutely be using that. Um, looking at um, your neighbor's location on the census and then searching through the, the system to get as much as possible out of the records that you're not seeing, right? Because you don't necessarily know the names of the neighbors, but you can find it that way. Um, so there's some real value in some of those search tools. There's also a search radius um, option that allows you to search within five miles or 10 miles. So if you find, you know, a postcard that has somebody's surname on it that you don't know and you don't know how they're related, use that radius tool to see if you can figure out who that person is. Um, I think about it in this sense, right? And this is the question I want to leave you with. If your ancestor was baking a cake and she needed a cup of flour, or he, who did they go to to get their cup of flour, right? That old story about like, you know, send your kid off to the neighbor's house to get a cup of flour because I'm short on flour or sugar or whatever I'm short on or an egg. Who did they go to? Who did they ask? Those are the kinds of details that make family history so exciting. And I think that's the kind of stuff that fan research can get for you. Um... So that's my, I'm going to get off my soapbox. I've been on the soapbox for a little while. Um, and I'm going to make one last call for questions. We have about 10 minutes left together. So let me run through some of these um, other comments. Um, we've got... Okay, Andrew says, I found this out about Mabel... Millichip by accident, searching for her husband, Frank. I have newspaper articles about her and pictures, but Kansas City Kennel Club 
have no information um, or what they say. So going back to the comment earlier about the Kansas City Kennel Club, could they be keeping quiet because this was in the 1940s for U.S. legal reasons? Um, a kennel club being held quiet for legal reasons? Not, I mean, nothing comes to mind. Um, I, I can't think of any any reason why that would be an implication, unless you think it was like a fighting club. But I, I don't, I mean, Kansas City Kennel Club doesn't really ring that way to me. I don't know that it would be like a published thing if they were like dog fighting. Um, but I'm not sure when dog fighting became illegal either. So um, you would have to look that one up, I think, Andrew. Um, but no, I can't, I, I can't really think of any reason why it would be intentionally hushed, uh, for any reason. It sounds like just, you know, a dog club to me, um, unless that's not what it is. Maybe kennel club refers to something completely different, but that was where my brain went. Um, so that's an interesting story, Andrew. Keep us posted on how you do on that. I would love to know more. Um, Victoria says she has a lovely autograph book, which belonged to my grandfather in the 1920s. He died when my mom was seven trying to work out who the signatures, et cetera, belong to. Not sure if some might have been school teachers or friends found some family names. That's 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 a good example, right? I, um, if you know, Victoria, where they were from, my one of my best recommendations would be to scan pictures of maybe one or two of the pages or some of the more easier to read autographs or even just every page, I don't know, depending on how big it is, um, and find a history-oriented Facebook group and post the images there and just say, you know, does anybody know who these people are? Um, I actually, in my family material, I had a handful of photographs that were clearly given to one of my ancestors, you know, like a senior portrait type thing. And it was, you know, instead of signing the annual, it was like, oh, best of luck this summer or whatever. It was great being in school with you or whatever. And they would hand them like a portrait card. Um, and I had a bunch of those and I was, I knew who they were because I actually also have the high school yearbook. So I was able to look them up in the yearbook and go, okay, that's so-and-so. I know for sure what her name is. So I posted the pictures to the local historical society Facebook group. And I had um, descendants today contacting me and saying, I don't have a picture of my grandma or my great aunt or whatever that that's my family member. So I actually ended up returning some of those um, portraits to the family, which was great, right? It was still really, really neat. Um, that I was able to do that. Some of them, no such luck, but at least I was able to identify them and connect some back to their descendants. So that was a, that was a cool project a couple years ago. Um, Lori says, um, fan research provided me with pictures of my dad and his twin brother as infants and toddlers and my grandparents. They were deceased when the boys were in teens and we had no pictures of them. Ah, oh, that's a great story. Um, so Andrew's followed up. It's not a dog club as in the UK version. She was the first treasure in the 1940s. So suspect data protection reasons. I, I, uh, I'm just not sure I'm following you on that one, Andrew, but, um, send it in, uh, to the find my past Facebook forum. Um, and, um, even tag me on it and, and give me a little bit more detail, Andrew, and we, we will work this out together. We'll figure out what the kennel club was. I'm not sure that I, instinctively don't don't think there's data protection reasons there but we'll see we'll see we'll work on that together annette um i have a relative that ran a pub called odd fellows i never knew of the organization i just had a quick search and they did have pubs so that gives me a new place to search yeah absolutely um organizations like that did a lot of, of stuff a lot of different things so please take a look at all of those and and you know if there's a term you're familiar unfamiliar with absolutely look it up um, and even the business name, right? Business names were inspired by a lot of different, uh, a lot of different places. Um, okay, so we've got a, just a couple minutes left. I do have one more thing I need to remind you of, and I don't want to forget this. Um, next week, Ellie is going to be doing um, community photos again next week, um, and so we are asking for your photo submissions. Um, so if anyone wants to send in a treasured family photo uh, with a little bit of a backstory um, to share on the session, send them to, via email to community at findmypast.com. So that's an email address, community at findmypast.com. Um, provide the image, the photograph itself, you know, a scan, um, a little bit of a backstory, and always helpful to include your first and last name, 
and that kind of information so that we can connect with you on Facebook as well. If you have interesting or, or photos that you treasure, um, I have tons. Uh, so I'm wondering, Ellie, if you just want me to send in like a thousand of them. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, but there are some really, really great photographs out there of our ancestors. So share your photos um, and, and let's highlight those on our community efforts so that we can all talk family history together. Um, it's always fun to, to share our stories. Gives, um, gives all of you a chance to really kind of focus on some of your discoveries as well. Um, so it, that's, that's, always, that's always a fun session to watch uh, and listen to. All right, let's see. Um, Christine says, I found a wealth of family info in the local church newsletters. Uh, children deaths were during a measles epidemic that was between senses. Wow, that's a great source. What an incredible example of fan research. That is extraordinary. Well done, Christine. Those church new newsletters um, can be super, super informative. So that's great. Um, Cliff says he's got a family story. So his aunt told him of a newspaper item with his uncle returning for the first time from the war, but he can't find it. So Cliff, you know, pay attention to all the newspaper sites. Things are being digitized all the time and added. Um, so definitely take a look at the newspaper collection on Find My Past or the British Newspaper Archive, whichever you prefer, um, and watch and, you know, make sure you sign up for those newsletter updates too, the email updates, so you know if a new newspaper title from the area of interest gets published so that you can go, oh, yeah, okay, I got the email this morning. Um, I'm going to make time, you know, today or tomorrow to actually go and look at that newspaper title that they just added. So make sure that you're doing that because it's always it's always helpful when you've got a specific item that you're looking for to know when new material from that location pops up. Um, all right. Oh, this is a good one. Kelly says, I found lots of articles in the paper about Freemasons holding their meetings in the pub. My great uh, times three, great times three grandparents were running. Fascinating to read about even though they were not members. If, absolutely. Um, and I'm wondering, it would be interesting to me to, to kind of timeline out the history of the lodge itself, because I'm, if they were meeting in a pub, they either didn't have their own building yet, um, or perhaps it was being renovated, or perhaps they had rented a space in a building and they lost to that for some reason, because it's somewhat unusual to have formal meetings in a public space. So that would be something, Kelly, that I would be really, really interested in looking at. And if you don't want to do that research, I'm going to tell you right now, I will, because that, that sounds interesting to me very much. So that's another one for the Find My Past forum. Um, throw the story in there, make a new post, and tag me on it, because I, I would love to look at that. Um, I love that kind of research. In fact, that whole section of my shelf back here, this is, and the two more sections over there are all Fraternal Society's uh, resources. So um, I really, really love this stuff. So if you want to share that, I would love to dig further. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and call it, I think. Uh, it's been a fun hour, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that talking about fan research in kind of a casual format kind of inspires you a bit, but also makes it seem like a little bit less intimidating. I think a lot of people look at this kind of organized um, methodology, and they get a little bit overwhelmed. So it's not that. Um, think about it about the cup of flour, right? Who did your ancestors get their cup of flour from? Those are the types of questions you're, you're trying to answer. So hopefully this has been a fun session for you. Um, just a reminder to um, um, send in photos uh, for next week's session with Ellie um, uh, to community at findmypast.com. The email is in the chat. And I do see Victoria has said, would you care to share the photo behind you on your memory shelf on white shelf? And I'm not sure which one you're talking about. That one, maybe? Um, it's probably the most prominent photo I see in my background, so I'll share it. Um, that was quick, right? Chairs with wheels. So the photo I think you're asking about is this one. Um, this is my great-grandfather, William, and his wife, Emma. This is their wedding photo. Um, I actually am blessed to have photographs of all my grandparents and all of my great-grandparents. Um, most of them are uh, wedding photos like this one. 
and this is a this is not the original it's a digital reproduction oh i did i picked the right one victoria thank you um, <laughs> Um, so I have kind of, you know, all the photographs in these matching frames um, like this. Uh, and this one, uh, let's see, they got married in Ording, Washington. And I don't remember the year right off the top of my, my head, but isn't. So she has this beautiful, wonderful hat. Um, and he, he is, hopefully you guys can see that the glare is not too bad. Um, the, his hair is actually what makes him stand out, I think. He had hair all, a lot like that his entire life. It was just naturally, I think, really curly. And he had a hard time containing it. But every time I find a new photograph uh, or see something or like, because he's in the fire department photograph, right? He's in this one too. And I look at it and go, oh, I know exactly which one is, is William because of his hair. <laughs> it's great. He has the best hair. And she has the best hat. It's a great photograph. So thank you for asking about it, Victoria. I love, I love sharing. It's great. Um, beautiful wedding outfit. It certainly was. Okay, so we're going to call it um, a week. Thank you all very much for joining us, as always. Find My Pass From Home um, is what we're, what we're all about. We're really excited to talk to you and engage with you and have you be a part of our community. So thanks for joining us. Um, share these broadcasts, right? Bring your friends next time. Um, and we will see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and get some research done, right? Spend some time doing some research. Um, we'll talk soon and have a great day. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Um, and some family history today. All right, we'll talk to you later.